Thank you much, very much, Sam, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Joe Bast, watching at home, for uh, asking me to speak about the social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon, or SCC, is a guesstimate of the cumulative damage to society from a ton of carbon dioxide emitted in a particular year. Policymakers, pundits, activists increasingly invoke these social cost of carbon estimates to justify the imposition of carbon taxes, cap and trade, Soviet style production quota for renewable energy, and other interventions to rig the marketplace against fossil fuels. Under President Obama, SCC estimation has become a routine feature of agency rulemakings. Now, if you listen to the SCC analysts, they would have you believe that carbon's social cost is an objective magnitude, like the price of wheat futures at the end of a trading day. In fact, the social cost of carbon is an unknown quantity, discernible in neither meteorological nor economic data. I think that's one main point that I want to bring out today. Try, for example, to discern carbon social cost in the following information. There has been no trend in the strength or frequency of landfalling hur hurricanes globally in the world's main hurricane basins over the past 50 to 70 years. There has been no trend in global accumulated cyclone energy since, the since 1970. There has been no trend in U.S. Hurricane-related damages since 1900, once you adjust for changes in population, wealth, and the consumer price index. Similarly, there have been no changes in global adjusted economic losses from all forms of extreme weather since 1960. Uh, if you look at uh, the United States, as urban air temperatures have warmed over the last several decades, heat-related mortality has declined. If you look globally, since, since the 1920s, death and death rates related to extreme weather have declined by 93% and 98% respectively. Since the year 2000 in Africa, incidence of malaria fell by 34%, and malaria mortality rates fell by 58% just since the year 2000, even though there was a 43% increase in the African population living in historic malaria transmission areas. I know those are a lot of numbers, but I'm trying to make the point that if you probe the data, you can't see a greenhouse fingerprint anywhere. Similarly, global yields of, of the major food crops, corn, soy, wheat, have all increased by 100% or more since 1960. Since 1982, there's been an 11% increase in green foliage in arid, dry areas on all continents of the globe, so much for global warming uh, in promoting desertification. Our friend Craig Idzo here has calculated, based on extensive empirical information and food and agriculture data, that the CO2 fertilization effect added $3.5 trillion in value to global agriculture since 1961 and will add another $11.6 trillion in value between now and 2050. If you look historically, the greater than present warmth of the Holocene optimum, the Roman warm period, the medieval warm period, all promoted human health and welfare. And historically, rising CO2 emissions and concentrations are strongly correlated with increases in population, life expectancy, and per capita income, which are the best overall indicators of human health and welfare. So carbon's social cost is not inferred from data. Where does it come from? It is projected by so-called integrated assessment models, or IAMs. These are computer programs that combine a climate model with an economic model. They project how CO2 emissions over time will affect the climate, and then how climate change will damage the economy. And there are three main of models, or IAMs, that the Obama administration uses. They have acronyms that go by the names of DICE, FUND, and PAGE. Okay, now there are three inputs in particular that determine the outputs from these IAMs. Climate sensitivity, how much warming occurs from a doubling of carbon dioxide concentration, 
the so-called damage function, how much GDP decreases as global temperature increases, and the discount rate used to compute the present value of future climate damages. By fiddling with these and other inputs, the social cost of carbon analysts can get almost any result they desire. That's another big point I want you to remember. And why would they fiddle? Well, the higher the estimated social cost of carbon, the greater the ostensible benefit of regulations that curb carbon dioxide emissions. So consequently, agencies have an incentive to continually inflate social cost of carbon estimates to increase the poor purported net benefits of their regulations. In other words, they have an incentive to find that climate change is always worse than we thought. For example, the Obama administration has this interagency working group and they have published two technical support documents on the social cost of carbon. In the 2013 document, the social cost of carbon estimates were on average 60% higher than in the 2010 document. So in just four years, carbon reduction regulations became 60% more valuable. You know, I mean, isn't that amazing? Uh, the agencies run these IAMs over an immense time span, out to the year 2300, ostensibly because climate change is a long-term problem, an intergenerational challenge, okay? But that makes the whole enterprise hopelessly speculative for two reasons. First, today's state-of-the-art climate models are on the verge of statistical failure. They increasingly fail to hindcast climate change over the past 36 years. So why should we trust their ability to forecast climate change over the next 285 years? Second, technology is what enables humans to adapt to whatever climate conditions we happen to live in. So the damage functions in these models are based on assumptions about how technology will change as the world warms. Not just how technology will, technology will change over the next 20 to 30 years, no. Far into the distant future, when James T. Kirk is an old man. So good luck with that. Now, social cost of carbon estimators use six tricks to get big, scary-sounding numbers that justify draconian regulations. Trick one is ignore all the post-AR4 climate sensitivity literature. The 2013 a uh, technical support document doesn't revise at all the 2010 documents, social, uh, climate sensitivity estimates, which come straight out of the IPCC's 2007 fourth assessment report. And we all know that a whole bunch of studies since then argue or find that those estimates are overheated. Trick number two is to use below market discount rates to calculate the present value of carbon dioxide impacts and reductions. OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, has a circular, A4, on regulatory accounting, and it says use a 3% discount rate and a 7% discount rate when you're ca calculating the costs and benefits of regulations. All of the models that the, uh, excuse me, the, the interagency working group using those three models that I mentioned, they only use discount rates up to 5%, so they ignored the high-end discount rate, which lowers the value of future projected harms and regulatory benefits. Now, the Heritage Foundation, our good friend David Kreutzer and his buddies over there, did an analysis of the DICE model using a 7% discount rate as required by OMB, and that reduced the DICE model's social cost of carbon estimates by 80%, just that one little fiddle of the dial. Okay, and then with an updated sensitivity distribution, with that literature after the the fourth assessment report, it brings down the social cost of carbon by almost 90%. So instead of it being $38 a ton, uh, it drops down to about $4 a ton. Now, one of the, one of the uh, big names in this, this field is Chris Page, uh, Chris Hope, who is the creator of the Page model. He recommends using discount rates as low as 1%. And when you do that, you get a social cost of carbon of $266 per ton, not way out in 2050 or 2100, but today. 
And the policy implication of that is obvious, and he spells it out. Renewable energy is more efficient than new natural gas combined cycle. All right? And installing solar power is more efficient than maintaining existing coal power plants. So here's another key ta takeaway point, which is that however interesting social cost of carbon analysis may be as an academic exercise, when it gets into the public policy marketplace, it is computer-aided sophistry. Okay? Its political function is to make renewable energy look like a bargain at any price and make fossil fuels look unaffordable no matter how cheap. Trick number three is, to, pre is uh, to present only global social cost of carbon values, not domestic values. The, the global values are higher because the United States has much greater adaptive capabilities than the world at large or on average. And so if you were to actually take these numbers and present them, it, it, present the domestic values, it would further reduce all these estimates by any anywhere from 7% to 23% of the global value. And again, in this OMB regulatory document, or uh, directive, OMB Circular A4, presenting the, the domestic values is mandatory, the global values is optional, but in these technical support documents of the interagency working group, they only present the global values. So it, Referring back to that heritage study of the DICE model again, if you were to just look at the U.S. domestic social cost of carbon, according to their own assumptions and, and methodology, it would bring it down to 28 cents a ton, to somewhere, bet yeah, somewhere between 28 cents and 92 cents a ton, which is negligible. Okay, another trick is to simply ignore the monetary benefits of CO2 fertilization, which I mentioned Craig Idzo's work Two out of the three models that are used by the administration have no CO2 carbon dioxide fertilization benefits. So those models are inherently biased. They've, they've flout the, the U.S. Federal Data Quality Act. They shouldn't even be used at all. Um, another trick is to assume, assume that adaptation is simply impossible above two degrees of global warming. So uh, again, this is the assumption of Chris Hope's page model. So we're supposed to believe that even in 2300, when Captain James T. Kirk is an old man, technology won't be able to offset the damages from two degrees of warming. And another trick, also in, in Hope's model, uh, is to assume that doomsday is not only more likely than we thought, but more costly. And, uh, and if, you, if you look at the... Uh, well, Judy Curry, Judith Curry, I think, said this very well. She, she looked at the potential disaster scenarios as reviewed by the latest IC, IPCC report, and she says, every single catastrophic scenario considered has a rating of very unlikely or exceptionally unlikely or has low confidence. But somehow, the administration got more confident about these disasters over the last four years. Now, my last point is that even if this social cost of carbon analysis were in exact science and rigorous economics, which it's not, it would still be one-sided and partisan because, and unsuitable as a basis for policymaking because it is never paired with a rigorous assessment of the social benefits of carbon energy and consequently of the social costs of carbon mitigation. And those costs are potentially staggering. They include the public health and welfare risks of policies that raise business and household energy costs, the economic, fiscal, and energy security risks of policies that endanger the shale rev revolution, Isaac, the economic development risks that, po that these policies uh, pose to development, developing countries by limiting their access to affordable energy, the risks to international peace and stability, of impeding developing country uh, economic growth through carbon caps or taxes or carbon tariff protectionism, the risks to scientific integrity when government is both the chief funder of climate research and the chief beneficiary of the alleged scientific consensus supporting new taxes, regulations, and mandates, and the risk to democratic accountability. That's another social cost of carbon mitigation. When agencies promote consensus climatology climatology to justify bypassing legislatures and marginalizing opponents as, quote, anti-science or as deniers. So to wrap up, the social cost of carbon is a pseudoscience 
that gives uh, regulators, uh, climate activists, and alternative energy rent seekers a new rhetorical tool for claiming special knowledge about climate risks and solutions and for lording it over the public and their representatives. Now, I think, however, that they are their own worst enemies and their overreach will come back to bite them. So some good may come out of this. The skeptic movement is to no small degree a reaction to the hubris of those who demand fealty to a political agenda based on errant climate models. With social cost of carbon analysis, the climate alarm establishment's pretense of knowledge and precision ceases to be artful and becomes blatant. And so skeptics are bound to have a field day debunking social cost of carbon anal analysis, and in fact, we already are. Thank you very much.